Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Minkle, Home Region Program Director at the Walton Family Foundation. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a conversation about inclusive growth in Northwest Arkansas. I hope most of you were able to participate on the first day of the conference. I'm looking forward to learning from national experts and community leaders over the next two days. But more importantly, I'm excited grantees and partners have the opportunity to highlight the work they're doing to improve communities here in Northwest Arkansas and across the country. Over the next hour, we'll be doing just that, listening to those who are working in cities across the region and learning about their approach to community-driven change. Before we dive in, I want to share the framework for the Foundation's strategic plan, how it informs our efforts in Northwest Arkansas, and the vision inspiring our work in the region over the next five years. You may have heard some of these themes throughout the day, but I want to take a few minutes to go over them in case some of you with us right now weren't able to join earlier in the day. The Foundation's new strategic plan is a reflection of our mission tackling tough social and environmental problems with urgency and a long-term approach to create access to opportunity for people and communities. We will work in three areas, improving K-12 education, protecting rivers and oceans and the communities they support, and investing in our home region of Northwest Arkansas and the Arkansas Mississippi Delta. As you can imagine, these are unique areas of work that there are three shared values that will function as connective tissue across all programs. The first is championing community-driven change to ensure our work reflects the voices and needs of the communities we support. The second is prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in our grant making and the voices we engage. And finally, collaborating with partners to develop innovative approaches that bring people, resources, and ideas together in ways that can be scaled. For the home region, that means honoring the Walton family's commitment to Northwest Arkansas and the Arkansas Mississippi Delta by helping creating opportunity and enhancing quality of life for all. So what does this mean for our approach in Northwest Arkansas? The Foundation's 2025 strategy envisions Northwest Arkansas as one of the most vibrant and inclusive communities in the nation. To build this foundation and this vision, we'll support community-led efforts that prioritize three main areas of work. Advancing economic and cultural vibrancy, supporting community leadership and capacity building, and fostering inclusive growth and a sense of belonging. The goal for today's session is to add more context about how we define inclusive growth, but more importantly, how that concept fits within the work already happening in our community. We wanna start this conversation by defining what inclusive growth means for us at the foundation. We believe inclusive growth means everyone who calls Northwest Arkansas home benefits from the region's successes and can fully participate in all the area has to offer. That ideal will have a strong influence on a number of efforts supported by the foundation. We intend to work closely with education partners to ensure every student in Northwest Arkansas is prepared for college and quality jobs. And we also want residents to be able to upskill or reskill to enter high potential fields. The foundation will also work with organizations focusing on housing and mobility issues to ensure residents can easily access the region's employment centers, services, and amenities. These ambitious areas of work will require partnerships with a broad spectrum of community organizations. We know there are many leaders in the region who are already working to solve these issues. Today's panel is an opportunity for us to listen to and to learn from local voices. I'd like to start with brief introductions of our panelists, although I'm certain most of you are familiar with their work. Today we have Kyle Kellums, who's the news director at KUAF. Kyle has graciously agreed to moderate this panel discussion. Also with us is Allison Esposito, executive director of the Creative Arkansas Community Hub and Exchange, also known as CASH. We're also joined by Melissa Leilan, executive director for the Arkansas Coalition of the Marshallese, Benton County Judge Mooring is also with us today. And finally, Rafael Rios, founder and executive chef at EAOs. 
Now I'd like to hand over the mic to Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you, Karen. Uh, excited about the conversation we're going to have and stick around because there will be an opportunity in about half an hour or so for questions from the audience to get to our panelists. So we're going to get everyone involved. I've got specific questions for each of you, but I want to start off with a, um, a, a particular question that I'm going to ask each one of you individually. And I'm going to start with you, Judge Mooring. Um, I'd like to hear your description of what you think inclusivity and belonging plays, what role in, in what you do and your area of work. Well, thank you, Kyle. I appreciate that. And I, I really appreciate being a part of this panel today. Um, I think this is a great panel, and I'm looking forward to actually hearing what everybody else has to say as well. I think the first thing I would say real quickly is that although I'm a judge, I'm not a, a, a courtroom judge in the classic sense. And a lot of folks don't realize that a county judge is almost like a, a de facto mayor of a county. And so I oversee kind of almost like a chief executive uh, officer oversees a lot of the functions of the county from infrastructure. HR, finance, emergency services, um, our dispatch, and a lot of things like that. And in that role, uh, as an elected official, I really think that I have to both reflect our community, and then I also have to lead change. And, and that can be a, a, an interesting balance sometimes. In, in direct relationships, some of the things that I need to work on there, that I work on with my team, are, are hiring, communications, and outreach. That's kind of where it starts for us. And so we're looking at improving those things as, as we go forward, uh, as we think about what the role is of Benton County uh, in, uh, in this new change coming to, uh, to our region. Thank you very much. Uh, Melissa, same question. What role do you see inclusivity and belonging in, in your area of work? Oh, um, that, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think it's it's very important for you know as, as Northwest Arkansas is currently experiencing this growth in terms of diversity, right? I think it's even more crucial for all of us to acknowledge um, diversity and and um, having uh, inclusion. You know, different communities. As as we all know, each community has its own you know differences. So I think it's very important for all of us to acknowledge that. As we move forward, if you if we want to make Northwest Arkansas a thriving community, a region, I, I think it's very important to acknowledge uh, different cultures and different communities. Thank you very much, Melissa. Allison, you know the question: What role does inclusivity play in your line of work with the arts in Northwest Arkansas? Thanks, Kyle. The Creative Arkansas Community Hub and Exchange, or CASH, works in the arts, culture, and creativity space, overarchingly the creative economy. And by its nature, the creative economy is inclusive because it thrives on innovative ideas, new combinations of sectors, the fundamental principle that the most useful, most productive, most creative ideas are, are always central no matter where they come from. And frankly, these ideas often come from the margins of a community, of an industry, of a chance encounter between two or more people who don't usually hang out in the same social circles. And this is where belonging becomes so important. Without a community that truly welcomes all people in, and not just in a token way, but really giving everyone a seat at the table, these productive creative collisions don't happen. Arts and culture have long been the community's um, biggest table and the place where we all gather to inspire, to disagree, to work through our collective problems, to come up with new solutions and new ideas. The creative economy harnesses that energy in new art forms, new businesses, new nonprofits that offer innovative solutions to our biggest challenges. And so we have to be absolutely certain as Northwest Arkansas continues this incredible growth period that we're in, that we're ensuring that growth and the opportunity it offers is truly inclusive. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Allison. Raphael, uh, unfortunately, since we're virtual, you couldn't cater this panel. Well, that's okay. I am curious about what you think about inclusivity in, in your line of work in, in this region. Uh, with the, the changes that I've seen since 2006 when my family moved here, um, we know that people come from all over the United States. We know that people will come from diverse backgrounds. Um, we know that there's Marshallese, we know there's Indian communities there. Uh, when it comes to our, my industry, uh, 
the opportunities are there. Uh, a lot of times we have to step out of our, of our comfort zone, if you will, and go find a little help ourselves. But the help is there. Uh, we, we need to make sure that uh, we start thinking about those newer communities. Uh, you know, I would love to see a, uh, a, a different kind of restaurants coming. We have a, a, a good amount of Indian, uh, Indian restaurants coming on board. We, uh, we have a Brazilian community around. We have all these, these, these people coming from all over the world. And, and uh, we cater to everyone. And I, I've seen that firsthand. I, I believe that we're going in the right path. Uh, we have to fine tune a little bit here and there, but um, you know we we got to find the help, and the help is there. We have to uh, do a little bit more, um, you know, working together. I think. Thank you, Raphael. And I want to remind everyone that's with us. We will have an opportunity for audience questions in about half an hour. Uh, Judge Morning, you mentioned that you're a chief executive of the county, and you've been here a while. You see. You've seen much of the growth that Northwest Arkansas has experienced. I'm wondering, from your time here, what you think uh, we as a region have done correctly to become more welcoming and what perhaps we could do better? Yeah, thank you, Kyle. I, I, I'll tell you, uh, my wife and I have been here a little more than 20 years now, and we had no idea at the time what a great decision we made. Uh, when we moved here, we promised each other five years and we're done and we're leaving. And, uh, and we've been here ever since. And it's just been a phenomenal, uh, just a phenomenal decision for us. We're so happy that we ended up both coming here and staying here. And you hear that a lot now from, from people who have come to Northwest Arkansas. And, and the difference is now, this is such a more desirable place uh, than even it was back then. The changes have been astounding and almost completely positive changes. Uh, I mean, a lot of the things that have happened here um, have happened because co communities like ours around the country, but particularly this community, as we have become more diverse, if you see the diversity and the multicultural numbers grow, you've seen our prosperity grow. And I don't think that's by accident. I think those, there's a very good relationship between those two. And the best communities around the country are experiencing that as well. Um, we have a much broader economy than when I moved here. I moved here to work for Walmart which is pretty much why everybody moved here 20 years ago, or to work for a supplier of Walmart. And there's not a darn thing wrong with that. We all, we all love that. But boy, our economy is so much more broad and diverse than that now than it used to be. So that's become a real strength of ours. I think there's a much stronger sense of entrepreneurship here than there used to be. Uh, you see lots of new business. You see lots of people trying new things here, which is terrific. We have a much wider array of cultural opportunities than before. Uh, and again, I think it's that, that, that influence that's come from around the United States, but also around the world uh, that has come right here to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we have terrific amenities that we didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, and so we've done a lot of things right. There's no doubt that this community is, is a, we're on all the top lists of desirability. And, and again, so I feel like we made a really great decision 20 years ago, not even knowing how great a decision it was to come here. Uh, from a government perspective, that actually, I don't want to say it makes governing easier, but in a way it does. Uh, you know, our tax base is strong. We're able to invest in infrastructure. We're able to invest in, in amenities. Uh, bond programs pass here because people want to reinvest back in their community. They see what's happening. Uh, even things like in the, in the next iteration of parks here in Bentonville, there's going to be cricket fields here. Uh, I promise you there aren't too many cities of 60,000 that are passing bond issues for cricket fields. <laughs> Uh, and so those are terrific things that have happened. Um, and at the county, we've been very happy to, pleased to be a part of that. But no, things are not perfect. Um, you know, you wanted me to talk about some things that we could do better. I think there's a, a few things that, could, that we could do better. And I think for a lot of people, 2020 exposed those. Uh, you know, this year that, that's sort of in our, in our rear view mirror, but not entirely yet. Um, and, you know, we had some things that have happened this last year that we know we need to work on. When, when COVID hit and the pandemic hit, uh, it became readily apparent um, that that a lot of us who were working in both state and local government needed to do a better job with some of the communities, the multicultural communities that were here, um, the Marshallese population, the Latinx population, you know, they were devastated uh, by COVID. And we needed to basically 
ramp up very quickly how we interacted with that community, how we communicated with that community. Uh, and it wasn't obviously just the county. A lot of folks had to had to refigure out how do you provide health care in those areas? How do you how do you talk to folks uh, that frankly may not have been on your radar before? And so we had to do a lot better job there. I hate to say we'd be better prepared for the next pandemic because I hope there's not another one for a hundred years. But but the fact is we will be better prepared for the next pandemic. So that was clearly a, a gap. Is there are there are pockets of people in our community right here right now that that we haven't been doing as good a job in communicating and outreaching to as we could have. <clears throat> the other one uh, that was exposed was the racial underpinning that's in our community. It's there. And that was certainly exposed by the protests from June, uh, by the you know, the tragic murder of George Floyd and the resulting protests in Bentonville and the Bentonville Square. Uh, I was on top of the Benton County Courthouse when that played out, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And, uh, and I knew that from a local government perspective and from a leadership perspective, not just myself, but local mayors, we all needed to do a lot better job of understanding what were the underpinnings of that. And so we've been working on that the back half of last year as well. Um, so I would say those are two areas where we definitely need to improve. Um, and I think there's a lot of improvement to be made there. Thank you very much, Judge. Appreciate the answer. Melissa, let me come to you. You, during your time in Northwest Arkansas, you've worked with private uh, sector, public, nonprofit, uh, bringing awareness and representation from the Marshallese community. I'm wondering how important, why it's important that public, private, nonprofit work together. Yeah, well, first of all, I want, also want to share with our audience that I'm also a veteran. Um, I spent 10 years in the armed forces. So commitment in, in serving the community is really uh, something that I've always uh, been trained and really loved, um, I've came and fall in love with. Um, but the intersectionality among these different sectors, uh, the public and the private and the nonprofit, it's just so important in terms of uh, raising awareness and ensuring that the underserved community uh, marginalized communities are, are at the table. Um, first, I want to also say these are three pillars in the makeup of the fabric to a community. And they kind of, I always tell my staff, they're the makers or the breakers. Either they make mm -hmm. the community the, uh, and, and I like their strength or they, they break down the community. Um, and they are very vital component in responding to the economic and the health crisis that we're seeing. And I think we all have seen that in the COVID-19 pandemic and the collaboration uh, among these three entities are so crucial, even more so in responding to, to COVID-19. In the wake of a uh, pandemic, our organization, and this is something, you know, this is an example that I'm using, um, you know, we use the data that we were seeing on the ground and really um, approach our legislators and let them know hey, whatever policy that's, that's preventing or barring Marshallese from accessing programs that they are paying into, we need to fix it now. Look at the death rate. The death rate here in Northwest Arkansas alone was over 50% at that time. I think that was like in May. Um, so we really have to kind of look at new ways for us uh, culturally um, you know, uh, doing the right action and ensuring that our legislators are aware of what what what's on the gun is kind of not like it's not part of our culture. So we have to step out of uh, you know the way we were looking at things and and approach and make a very progressive like a very uh, a, a movement that would um, not only benefiting our people that we were serving, but also, you know, to me, it was an injustice that was done 25 years ago. You know, barring uh, Marshallese from accessing things that they pay into 25 years ago was, I mean, to me, that was an injustice and we all needed to fix it. And they saw that. I think there was a lot of um, understanding that there were a lot of health issues but if anything, COVID-19 really um, elevated that. It highlighted all those underlying uh, health issues and social, you know, social issues as well, economic issues. So everything really, um, you know, unfortunately, we have to use um, the COVID-19. But also what we learned from that, the, the partnership and the collaboration among these three entities are very important. Yes, we were able to co collect these data. 
But if it was not for funding that we were, um, you know, getting at that time from, you know, the the Walton Foundation on or Endeavor Foundation at that time or Arkansas uh, Community uh, Foundation, you know, it, it it seemed like everyone really came together, and that was because we we had a plan. We had a plan to ensure that the community in general understood where we were coming from. You mentioned finding new ways and 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 growing the the collaboration. What do you think? And and this is a big question for a couple three minutes. I understand. What do you think are the greatest economic, cultural, or social barriers uh, to creating a more inclusive Northwest Arkansas? I think we are really already having conversation around that. And and if you look at Northwest Arkansas, if you compare it like. From 10 years ago, when I first, or 15 years ago, when I first moved in, the word DEI was not even part of anything. You know what I mean? Look, so I think there are a lot of uh, DEI work and a lot of things that are happening, finally happening um, at this point. But uh, the, the, the biggest barrier to me is you have to look at economics and culture and social social barriers, you know. Over 80% of our Marshallese clients that come to our doors are what we consider very low wage income. And a lot, of, actually 80% of our uh, of issues that we're seeing are around housing needs, food insecurity, so things like that. Um, you know, I think as, as long as, you know, we're, we're paying, uh, paying people low income or, or the minimum, you know, it's going to, these, these families, they're, they're barely making it. They, they have to either choose between paying rent or pay, you know, put food on their table. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the cultural side of things, I think there needs to be a lot of education on both, both sides. I think a lot of people don't understand that, that the history of the Marshallese and why they became uh, Northwest Arkansas resident or Arkansas residents. A lot of people don't know the history, the, the nuclear legacy uh, history that occurred, um, you know, right after World War II, uh, when 67 bombs were detonated, including the one that was 1,000 times strength, the time, uh, the Hiroshima bomb. So a lot of people don't know, don't, don't really know the, the, the status that the Marshallese have. Um, it, it's a lot, it's a lot to go. And I think um, as long as we're not giving, providing opportunities, equitable opportunities, for communities that are underserved, I think uh, we're still going to continue to see things the way they are. Thank you, Melissa. A reminder that we will have an audience question and answer period coming up in about 20 minutes or so. Allison Esposito, Cash, I'm going to come to you next. You kind of touched on this in your opening answer. Arts has the ability to bring so many people together. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, and, and, and it can tell some unseen stories as well. It, it gives an opportunity to give voice. How do you see the art sector contributing to inclusivity in Northwest Arkansas? Yeah, this question really hits it on the head, Kyle. I think the shared experience and the untold story um, are two really important themes. As you know, the arts brings people um, who may not think they have much in common together to experience one another's cultures, traditions, stories, challenges. Um, and the sector has been transformational in breaking down barriers and fostering understanding across the globe for a very long time. Um, Northwest Arkansas um, is incredibly diverse across every definition of that word um, and has always been a treasure trove of creativity. And if we take the region as a whole, um, with each of our cities and all the places in between, we have everything that we need right now to be a leading creative market in this country. Um, we have the opportunity to coordinate and connect and more equitably resource the full range of our inspiring creative economy, especially our artists of all kinds, which are the core and key to every creative place and ensure that those two crucial ideas that you're mentioning, the shared experience and the untold story are really at the forefront of what we're doing. Um, creativity broadly and the arts specifically are really uniquely geared to addressing both. There's so many examples in this region of folks and organizations who have been creating shared experiences and sharing untold stories that have inspired me um, in the last year and a half that I've been living here in the region by arts and culture. And they need our support right now more than ever. Um, from the Latinx Theater Project 
to nonprofits like Music Moves and the newly named Interform with Melissa's incredible leadership, ACOM, as well as our bigger institutions like Crystal Bridges. Last night, I went to see Crafting America, their new exhibition, and was sort of blown away that even a cultural discipline that I'm less familiar with, craft, most broadly defined, has for millennia been this incredible shared experience, in some ways the only shared experience that underrepresented in oppressed communities could find an outlet in to tell their stories. This tapestry of a community is what Cash has tried to get at with one of our programs, OzCast. We set the table, in this case, the online table, um, and invited artists and creatives from across the region, from all disciplines, to share their untold stories and those of their communities. The magic that has unfolded and, and is continuing to unfold and the connections that have been made across cultures and artistic disciplines um, surprised our team and, and lots of community members. The magic um, that we found there is possible only when we collectively open up to the abundance of inclusivity and not just in a passive way, but in a creative and proactive way, um, searching for, for how to connect with one another. A uh, quick follow-up for you, Allison. How can we in the community elevate the voices of artists, uh, and, and and why is that important? Gosh, yeah. Um, over the last year, we've seen more clearly than ever before the need for holistic systems and structures to support our creatives across the country, um, many of whom are working within the gig economy and have just been incredibly negatively affected. Um, but, you know, elevating artistic and creative voices has to be genuine and deep. It can't just be tokenistic or surface level. We should be asking artists their opinions, not just the occasional focus group or as background music while we're eating wonderful food, but as members of our boards, as citizens in our public policy and as visionaries who can get us to the next level of thinking as we're solving any problem. Artists are innovators who understand the process of innovation and rely on it in their own creative process. And that's something that's useful for so many of us and so many of the industries in which we're working. Artists shouldn't be put on pedestals or, or demonized or ignored. I think all of those approaches that we're so used to have sort of dehumanized and separated artists. Um, and if there's anything that makes creative people different, it's just that they have this uncanny ability to view our everyday lives from a slightly different position, point of view, angle, through a different lens. Um, and by doing this in any context, from a DIY space to the boardroom, they widen our perspective, which, which lets more people in. Um, and all of a sudden, we can see a little bit more broadly together. So I guess on a practical level, hire an artist, buy their work, eat their food, go visit Raphael at Yayo's, um, put their work up in a place you love and talk about it, put it on the car stereo, get a tattoo, uh, do all of this now um, with artists that you know, with artists that you don't, um, but especially those whose worldview potentially challenges yours. Um, we all need to be opening more doors and building more bridges these days in very practical, everyday ways with our neighbors. Thank you, Allison. And what we call in radio a segue, because we're going to move right into the culinary with Raphael, uh, an art of itself. I, I'm, I, you've got an amazing story about how you got started in Northwest Arkansas. I'd love to hear about that. Was there mentorship? Was there help? And, and, and do you try to mentor others now that you have this established uh, presence? Thank you, Kyle, for the question. Uh, uh, mentorship uh, was not available to the way, to the level it is right now for me, because I kind of decided to open up a food truck after seeing the opportunity for uh, uh, a business model that was unique at the time. Um, having been able to work with the farmer's market in Rogers uh, in 2006 with very little success. Um, and then moving into the uh, Bentonville Farmer's Market uh, with a little bit more success our first year, with a little bit more support at the time. Again, uh, this was, um, the opportunities came upon our exposure to uh, certain community leaders at the time that saw something in, in, in us that was that was great and, and they, they wanted to share with the community. And so did we, obviously, that's why we were there. Um, I, when I decided to open a food truck in 2012, it, it, there was uh, downtown Bentonville was, uh, with Dan Hintz was uh, the newest thing. Uh, it, it was, uh, 
a lot of people working really, really hard to get this community really to where it is now. Um, and that, that's how really how we started uh, the, the the permitting, the the city council, and everybody was very supportive. Um, but a lot of the work I had to do on my own. Uh, I did reach out to them at the time for certain numbers, certain connections. Um, but the resources were, were not as vast as they are right now. Um, however, uh, we got uh, everything we needed and more. Um, quite honestly, the, the uh, being included into the Bentonville Farmers Market as the first first uh, uh, non-white uh, farmers to ever be there was groundbreaking, and it felt really good. Um, I, I really think that the uh, the opportunity it was there not just for us but for everyone else um and we just had to get out of our comfort zone being a, 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 the latinx community we are people that love working we are people that um might lack the resources uh financially at many many times to to do great things out there and but we do have great desire. We want to to be successful. This is one of the reasons why we're here. Um, but we also have the sense of family, and uh, that is second to none. Uh, I believe that that uh, that is something that we can work on because if you, in my personal opinion, is that a lot of us. I'm speaking for the Latinx community. We are people from rural areas back in our countries. We know rural. We know farming. We know uh, we know community. The problem comes when you really no longer have the ability to financially sustain, or or you have to send. You know, you might have a, a family that is halfway around the world or or back home where you have to send money to them or something like that so it's it's that that sense of family is always going to be there so for you to start a business for instance it's going to require a lot more than you and just your family it's going to require it requires uh, a little bit of uh resources if you will which are also there but how do we identify these people to come and and uh, and identify them and and shape them to become really great leaders and and you know do do great things for the community. So, all right. Uh, quick, quick question uh, to follow up, Rafael. Uh, what can be done? What resources can be used to make sure small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, can still be successful? even as we're in this very tough pandemic year? It's really tough, but uh, I, I really think that, um, I, again, identifying the the, uh, the current leaders, the, if, if the leaders that are trying to do already, the, the ones that are right now trying to do something for their communities, how do we empower them to then go out there and reach out to the school counselors and you know the the sports uh, community, the biking community. Uh, how do we get the uh, bi other business owners to identify this talent, right? And then and then and then give them you know powerful tools to to uh, to create something better for, for number one for their families for, so, so they can have a better quality of life but now this is also going to improve the quality of life of the people that live around us um as an example i mean there's there's uh, there is a professor in the university of arkansas his name by by the name of uh, uh montgomery michael montgomery and he is dedicated many, many years in the Latinx community to um, to teach these children um, base and get them scholarships to the University of Arkansas. Um, 
I know because I'm, I'm a direct uh, recipient. My daughter was there and I have a nephew that was there. And then uh, those kids have other friends that were there. And then they go to um, the OPYO, the Ozark Mini Youth Orchestra, and they try it and they don't feel like they belong. And they go to dating school and they don't feel, feel, feel like they belong. It's a total culture shock for them, right? Um, so finding, finding the talent, get, finding out what this talent really needs and wants and how do they feel uh, so that we can empower them. We, we give them the tools they need, you know, and, uh, but, but I have, I have, I can go on and on with the uh, Arkansas Latina is back with, uh, you know, they're, they're starting something great for the Latino Latinx community uh, in regards to empowering women and, and making sure that they have the same opportunities as everyone else in regards to, um, to the biking uh, community, you know, music, arts, Octavio Logo, uh, controversial at times, but great guy, uh, you know, and, and how, do we, what, how are we shaping these people, these communities, these, ki these kids, you know, uh, at, in, in, in school, like since they're very, very young. Thank you very much. I wanna bring uh, our audience into this. Uh, questions that we can ask the panelists. Also, Karen Minkle, Walton Family Foundation. Uh, I'm going to bring you into the opportunity to be asked uh, questions. Our, our first one, uh, and I think this is for everyone, so we'll just open it up. Uh, what immediate actions are being taken from community and city levels to care for our homeless population during this week's cold snap? We're going to be in single digits or you know, around zero. What lessons are we learning to address these emergency needs for the future? Judge Maureen, I'll, I'll start with you on that, but I want any, anyone to kick in. Sure, it's a good, it's a good question, and and uh, obviously this is an, an unusual situation with how cold uh, how cold it is. I know that there are, are various shelters that have put word out here locally uh, to make sure that that folks who are homeless have a place to go. I can't speak for what's happening in Washington County, but I know the Salvation Army shelter here and others have put word out. Um, and I think that's the most immediate thing that's happening. This cold snap will be over with in about a week. But in the meantime, uh, folks do need to find and look out for those shelters that have put uh, that have put the word out that that they're available. Anybody else? All right. <laughs> Let's see if we have another question from our audience. Um, in the interim, I, I, I do want to have, well, here's, here's one. How will Benton, Judge Maury, I think we're coming back to you. How will Benton County work to improve transportation equity beyond vehicle-based travel? So bike, pedestrian, bus, transit like that. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great question too. And, it, and at the county, we work closely with, uh, with our cities. And our, our cities is where the, where, the, where the density is, and they are the ones that take care of the city roads. We get more involved in what's happening from a county perspective. I'll tell you, we are, we are working um, with the folks who work on the trails, whether it's the Walton Foundation and others, on how do we make some of our dirt roads more accessible for folks who ride out on, out on the dirt roads, who ride out there. But that's mostly for pleasure more than it is for actual commuting. Otherwise, I know that Ozark Regional Transit is, has reshaped how they approach this and are concentrating more on like the I-49 corridor and that there's going to be more opportunities for transit along I-49. Uh, that's not something from a county perspective we're, we're too actively involved with because most of those routes are within cities, but I know that that effort is underway as well. I want to offer anybody else up who has a, a thought about that question was specifically about Benton County, but anybody else? with Northwest Arkansas and, and transportation? Yeah, uh, certainly I, I can, uh, you can see what's, what's happening in uh, when you, when each one of us personally commutes from work, uh, what used to be a 15 minute uh, ride to work, it now becomes a 45 minute, uh, you know, ordeal. Uh, so there, there is, there is definitely a, going to be a need for or more intra-city systems, uh, I believe that uh, people will be um, more than willing to use, utilize the systems uh, and with the amount of biking and trails that is happening right now, this is, 
this is potentially a, a great way to mitigate having too many vehicles at, on the road during during peak times. Uh, you know, something at least to consider. Uh, we have a system already that uh, could easily be um, expanded slightly into the inner cities and 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 figure out a way to to uh, be a little bit more creative uh, in that regard. All right. Thank you, Rafael. We have a question specifically for Karen Minkle. Uh, given Raj Chetty's research, does inclusive growth imply necessi necessitate a focus on the neighborhood? How can we build social fabric at the neighborhood level across Northwest Arkansas? Thanks. I really appreciate that question because um, this is exactly uh, what prompted a lot of our thinking in our 2025 strategy it was Raj Chetty's research about the importance of neighborhoods and social capital and how that is built at the neighborhood level. I think as, as we look forward, I think there's a lot of learning we want to do because we want to understand where that's happening now. So what are the places and spaces and experiences that our residents are um, taking advantage of that are building connections between different groups of people? And then how can we help support the creation of those spaces and experiences that bring people together? Um, so I, I think it is a, it is something that I think the entire region will learn from. I think over the next few years is a better understanding of where this is happening in our region already and then how we can do more of that in more neighborhoods. All right, we have a question for the entire group. Melissa, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to answer first, but it's for the entire group. Uh, have you recently seen any standout moments that exemplify the inclusive growth you hope to see in Northwest Arkansas? Um, <laughs> that is a, a, a good question. And um, I, I have seen a lot that's going on more uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, again, art, the, the art world is just like popping uh, right now. And uh, more support that we get, um, you know, that I wouldn't have never gotten like 15 years ago, especially from, you know, foundations like the Walton Foundation uh, or the Walmart Foundation, you know, those folks. So in that sense, yes. Uh, however, I also want, I, I don't, I also want us to think about, you know, uh, things that we could do as a community, even, you know, things like policy, we need to change policy that that could be more uh, offer more um, access to to things, uh, resources uh, to again. When I'm going to use underserved communities because that's what I work with all the time. So there is a it, it, you know if you look at overall yes, but you know when you really zoom in into different communities, there are certain ones that are you know um, have not moved, I like to say, uh, move the needle yet. Um, so, yeah. Anyone else on the panel uh, want to talk about a standout moment that they have seen recently that exemplifies the inclusive growth hoped for in the region? Um, you know, I, Carl, I'll just... I, I got something. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Judge. Raphael, and then Judge. No, Raphael, Raphael, please go. Okay, uh, so I, I agree. There's there's many many instances where you can see the stand up moments. Uh, the infrastructure that's happening throughout Northwest Arkansas is is a testimony of what's really happening in all of the communities with downtown Rogers revitalization programs, uh, Spring Springdale revitalization programs are that are bringing more businesses in. Uh, each one with a unique feature, a unique uh, the. Um, audience, uh, not necessarily based on on race, but it's it's an audience that is going to also uh, be inclusive. Uh, you have a beer garden in downtown uh, Springdale coming with the with the German uh, German. We have uh, Mexican restaurants opening up in, in you know in different locations that are are not necessarily the the corridor that was uh, you know known for having the, 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 the vast majority of the Mexican restaurants in the community uh, um, of 71 business. 
you know, people are trying to, they're starting to venture out. They're trying to really see that, that there is inclusion, that there is opportunities outside of our very own communities. That's, I believe that's important. Um, but, I, you know, that the infrastructure itself, uh, speak, you know, speaks numbers uh, with all these, these organizations helping to, to, uh, to provide a, a unique experience for each one of the cities in the downtown areas, for instance. Judge Mooring, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's a standout moment, but I, I would just say, you know, last year as as people were growing very tired of the pandemic and wanting to get out more, uh, I worked very close to the Bentonville Square, and I, I was just amazed um, at the number of people that were gathering on the square um, and all the different kinds of people, whether it was age or multicultural differences. Um, you know, the Spark Cafe was was slinging more ice cream than they've ever uh, put out there before. And I just was amazed at some of these late summer nights uh, and fall evenings as I would leave work or I'd come back down and see uh, how, you know, the square is a congregation place in Bentonville. But we have those in other cities and, and towns as well. And that has stood out to me is just how amazing that uh, that, that has become. Um, and I don't think it was that way 20 years ago uh, when I got here. So those are kind of the standout moments that I see because I'm close to it. And just uh, seeing how people are getting together and congregating like it's just normal life here in Northwest Arkansas on a nice sunny day. Allison or Karen, a standout moment? Sure. Well, I was going to add something and say, um, you know, I was using this metaphor earlier with someone today where I said, I think it's, I think this effort is, um, it's like walking through a fog and then all of a sudden you're drenched that it's a lot of incremental steps. And so I was going to say, I don't know if I have a standout moment, but I can say, you know, as I look at some of the infrastructure that's being supported across the region in meaningful ways, when you think about housing and a project like Willow Bend, which is a mixed income neighborhood in Fayetteville, as well as six projects that were awarded, um, tax credits from the state to do housing development that adds to the diversity of options we have in the region in the past year. That's, that's pretty remarkable for a region of our size. And I think when you look at how um, our, our cities are approaching the design of their major streets to incorporate multiple modes of transportation, those are all significant changes that last you know, far beyond our lifetimes. So I think that it's a I think those are credits to um, all the different community organizations leading those efforts and really are emblematic of this uh, of inclusive growth. Allison, I want to let you have a chance to talk about standout moment. Thanks, Kyle. I, I think there's so many, and for me, it's really been at the human to human level, and I, I'm interested to see how these will translate into systems um, that work to support everyone. Um, but an example that just popped into my head is um, the first Marshallese food truck right now, um, really coming together as a result of a bunch of different communities and cultures sort of coming together to support this incredible chef um, to do this thing. And we think it's the first the first time. So um, really granular levels like that where, where you can see folks coming together and, and, and really supporting one another is what's been most inspiring to me. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, boy, we I know there were other questions and we could have done this for another hour. That's great. You know where these people are. You can, you can reach them if you have other questions. Thank you, Raphael, Judge Morin, Melissa, Allison. Thank you so much for your participation. We could have kept going. Perhaps we'll have a part two soon. Karen, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks, Kyle. And thank you to our panelists and everyone watching for participating in this engaging and really candid discussion. It's been a privilege to have this conversation with all of you. And we started this dialogue stating a vision for Northwest Arkansas, ensuring that it's one of the most vibrant and inclusive places to live. This is a bold and ambitious goal. And really based on the conversation we've had here today, it feels as though it's within reach if our community works together and taps into our collective innovation, talent, persistence, and curiosity. 
The conference continues tomorrow, and it includes a virtual reception at 4 p.m. Central, where Bentonville Mayor Stephanie Orman and local artists will showcase the cultural vibrancy of the region. I hope you'll be able to join and have a great evening.